I would like to welcome you and introduce our, our speaker for today. And then after I give the introduction, then there will be a short video so that, that can be ready to go. Dr. Arshad Emmett has been Vice Chancellor of LUMS since 2018. He completed his MBA and PhD in Educational Psychology at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec. He won a lifetime 3M National Teaching Fellowship in 1992 and was Professor of Finance at Concordia University's John Molson School of Business for more than 20 years. With research interests in student evaluations of teaching, teaching philosophies, student partnerships and transdisciplinary learning and educational practices. Prior to his current role as VC of LUMS, Dr. Arshad Emmed served at McMaster University in Canada as teaching and learning vice provost and director of the Paul McPherson Institute for Leadership, Innovation and Excellence in Teaching. He's also chair of Teaching and Learning Canada, former president of the Society for Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, and former vice president of the International Consortium of Educational Developers. He serves on the board of directors for Academics Without Borders, dovetailing well with LUMS's motto of learning without borders. Earlier this year, Dr. Arshid won the prestigious International Educator of the Year Award by the Academy of International Business. So please join me in giving him a warm welcome. A world without borders is a world without boundaries. A world where nothing divides us or holds us back. We are the dreamers ready to break down borders. Because our walls do not bound us. We are for those who have the hunger to learn. We are the science that seeks tomorrow. And the engineers that build it the visionaries that mold it. We make it our business to go global, elevate the status of education, and change the way this world works. By stepping beyond, we have pioneered education, promoted equality, and nurtured innovation. Our search takes us to the mountains in the north, to the arid deserts in the south, because where you come from does not matter. Merit does. And every penny we make goes back into the university. Because we are for education, not profit. So when you break these boundaries with us, we go beyond. Beyond the map and into the future. Because we thrive without borders. We're diverse without borders. LUMS. Learning without borders. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Nettleton, Rector, Dr. Douglas Trimble, Vice Rector, Dr. Nair Fardos, Registrar, faculty, staff, 
people in the Zoom room, in the spillover room. Assalamu alaikum, all of you. <clears throat> Greetings. I'm really delighted to participate in this wonderful retreat. And thank you for this privilege and honor to be with you this afternoon. Institutional effectiveness is a timely theme for this retreat because it asks us to think carefully, not just about what we do, but also to question the purpose of our work. So in this talk, I'd like to explore the title of my talk, which is how small universities make a big difference. You might be wondering, what is a small university? And more importantly, what do I mean by a big difference? Well, let me first begin with some good news, which is the recognition we have been receiving in the last couple of years, um, in particular by Times Higher Education as the 50th best small university in the world. We are classified small because we have about as many students as you do, depending on whether you include intermediate, we have about 5,000 students half of which live on campus, and uh, approximately 45% of them are female. We also have over 40 mission-driven programs across five schools that you just saw a glimpse of, and this is uh, to try and uh, come up with a very personalized, learner-centered experience. We have over 300 qualified faculty, um, who have degrees from top universities around the world. Most of them are from Pakistan and they've come back to serve their country and to work at LUMS. We also now have a growing number of alumni, some 17,000 if I count the um, convocation class of uh, 2022, of which I would say about um, 10,000 plus are in Pakistan and the remainder are scattered all around the world. Uh, most uh, of our big cohorts you can find in the UAE, in the UK, um, some of the other European countries, and mostly in Canada and the United States. <clears throat> but how can small universities like yours and like LUMS make a big difference? <clears throat> What I want to do is to highlight a few initiatives through a guiding perspective that we believe is making a big difference. And that guiding perspective is summarized in just three words, which you saw earlier, or learning without borders. Um, so learning without borders, what does that really mean? Because it, uh, as I mentioned, is a perspective, it might even be considered a philosophy, but we think of it as um, um, you know, a way of thinking where we break intentionally disciplinary, geographic, gender, and socioeconomic barriers through innovation to serve our wider community. So it shares many attributes that I'm sure is encapsulated in your own motto, which I saw on your uh, office uh, entrance. I think it was by love to serve others. And it's, it's just a wonderful slogan. I think we could all do with a lot more love and a lot less of everything else. Um, so that is very inspiring indeed. At LUMS, to make learning without borders visible, I'll speak about three things. The first is about diversity. The second will be about the importance of merit and how that permeates through everything we do. And finally, uh, what are some very specific examples of how we elevate our research and teaching endeavors? So to talk about diversity, promoting that and thinking about access, of course, is a national issue, not just a LUMS or a FCC issue. And um, <clears throat> you know, we know that um, it has a huge impact on young countries like Pakistan. I mean, all we hear about are all the difficulties and challenges facing Pakistan, but we should remember that it's a young country and uh, countries before us that have had longer histories have taken time to overcome the kinds of challenges that are confronting us. Um, nevertheless, <clears throat> we have 220 million people, two out of three are under 30 years old, 
and the enrollment rates are, I believe, around 7% or something like that, very low compared to our neighboring countries. To support and give access to the best and brightest is, of course, Mission Central at LUMS. And one of the flagship programs that personifies our approach to um, uh, be inclusive and to accommodate diversity, we introduced the um, uh, now well-known, I hope you've heard of it, called the National Outreach Program, or NOP, which targets students from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. And when I say the most disadvantaged backgrounds, I'm talking about family incomes, uh, average size of a family of maybe five or six people with no with earning a total of no more than 40,000 rupees a month. Um, so we're really looking at uh, uh, very um, marginalized groups here. <clears throat> In 2021, this is uh, just last year, <clears throat> we um, uh, showcased this program in an international competition that was run by CASE, which is the Council for the Advancement of Studies in Education. It's a Washington-based NGO. And we won uh, from, I don't know how many entries around the world, the platinum, the highest award for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I want to quote something that they said in the citation for the award, quote, the NOP's ability to identify talent from 140 towns and villages across Pakistan is impressive. We appreciated the various layers of diversity and its sustainability could be a model for universities globally if similar investments were committed. <clears throat> so what is the investment we make in the NOP program? We spend a billion rupees each year to run the NOP program. And of course, other related financial support that we provide to one out of three students. That's a big number. I mean, people think LUMS is a rich place for rich kids. And this is absolute misinformation that I hope you will help me to dispel uh, because <clears throat> of that billion rupees, while we go out there, and this is primarily a lot of my time in meeting with uh, corporate leaders and other philanthropic organizations, um, we only raise half of that amount uh, through those efforts. And we used to get funding from places like USAID or uh, uh, some of the uh, bigger organizations in the UK, uh, DFID, for example, but all of the, those programs have been phased out. So we're basically on our own. And um, I will say that uh, the investment, you know, uh, every single rupee is worth the spend. But what it does is when you don't get enough from uh, donors, <clears throat> then you have to reallocate other resources. Um, and that's how it becomes uh, very challenging to manage a 100-acre campus like yours with five thriving schools, especially science and engineering that is extremely resource intensive. Let me talk a little bit about gender diversity. Um, one of the initiatives that might interest you was from the School of Business just uh, two years ago, and that was featured as an innovation that inspires. That was the title chosen by AACSB. This is the accrediting body for business schools that you may have heard of, where only we have been fortunate enough to be accredited the only Pakistani business school to be accredited by AACSB. So that brings us into the ranks of 5% of business schools globally. But this is what they said about the diversity effort at the school. Quote, the business school's women's scholarship is the first in the world to extend a 50% tuition waiver to any woman accepted to any of its graduate programs advancing women's access to higher education and creating transformative social impact. So you can just imagine, you know, uh, I can give you the numbers. Just two years ago, if you went and joined our MBA program or the executive MBA program or some of the MS programs, uh, we've introduced four new MS programs only last year, you would have found that the ratio of females is, was about uh, 14% or so. 
after the scholarship, we now see over one out of three students are female. Uh, some of the MS programs are predominantly female. And what that does is not just a number or a ratio, it changes the whole discourse in the classroom, the questions that are asked, the way uh, cases are chosen for those particular courses, the conversations that occur uh, outside the classroom where most of the learning occurs and so on and so forth have been a very, very important signal for us and has led to a number of other initiatives. Uh, for example, we are uh, we have uh, uh, paid special attention for um, making sure that uh, there are uh, machines in every washroom that accommodate women's needs, um, that we are period friendly, and that uh, we have had conferences and we have had a lot of uh, attention paid to sensitize people about uh, what women experience when they are in these kinds of learning environments. The second factor that I wanted to talk about is merit. <clears throat> I think no one will dispute that merit is really one of the pillars on which any institution must rest on. Um, you know, we think of merit as the key ingredient for quality and for excellence in who we are and what we do. And this governs everything from admissions. And I can, I can assure you every year, as I'm sure my colleagues face this all the time, that you get phone calls from the uh, every corner of the country that my daughter or my son is deserving to be in. He did this, she did that. And how come you did not let her in? And uh, uh, sometimes it's framed as a question. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, they try to be more persuasive um, and use other pressure tactics. And we've had several examples of that, but we have never wavered. Every student who comes in, comes in on merit. Uh, even if they are getting scholarships, and especially the NOP students, we recognize they are coming from these villages and towns and districts where, you know, some of them can barely uh, have a command on English, let alone do well on SATs and other entrance requirements. So what we do is we bring them in uh, pre-metric, the talented potential students. Thousands of them come to campus for uh, a couple of weeks. They get coaching so they can compete fairly, and, and then we admit them if they make the mark. So it's all about merit. But it's not only about students, it's also about faculty and career progression. And here too, it's not about seniority. One of the things I noticed is that for every of our functional areas in operations, we had some 14 levels of titles uh, that people kind of just received after a certain period of time based on seniority. We have absolutely uh, gone away from that system and we flattened that out so that we allow a much more decentralized work environment where people can actually switch roles and have mobility within the university so they can expand their skill sets and not be tied to a job description, which tends to then put us in silos and then people don't work with each other as, as effectively because they don't know what other people are up to. And people jealously guard the senior ones who joined perhaps as a very junior person, their skill sets did not change. 20 years later, they are managing the entire unit because of seniority and struggling. So this is a kind of a change process that takes a lot of time. Uh, but uh, those are some of the initiatives that we are, uh, that are underway. A um, <clears throat> couple of examples that stand out that I think had a national impact uh, related to merit. One was that uh, the four-year bachelor's program that we're all now used to is a norm in the country wasn't the case uh, before 1996. You might recall the degrees were for two years. Um, and uh, despite HEC and other uh, pressures not to change to a four-year program, we went ahead because you need 16 years before you can do masters around the world. So why wouldn't Pakistanis get the same opportunity? And so we did that. And uh, uh, I'm very glad to see that that has become the nor norm, just uh, as the is the case for the five-year law degree program that we have now that is being emulated. 
Now, uh, COVID-19, who cannot remember COVID-19 is still with us to some extent, but uh, uh, I was uh, overjoyed when I received the invitation. And initially when we were talking about this, it was going to be over Zoom. And I said, oh, not another Zoom meeting. I'm just Zoomed out for the last couple of years. Um, but when the possibilities uh, started to improve around the world, not just in Pakistan, and Pakistan did so well during COVID, relatively speaking, um, uh, I suggested, why don't we have a live meeting? And I'm so glad that all of you have also showed up. Uh, I'm very happy to see you here. You know, COVID was a very difficult time for all of us, uh, and there's no doubt about that. And I don't want to undermine the challenges it presented. But at the same time, I will say that COVID was also a window of opportunity in, in many different ways. And one of those opportunities was uh, uh, to uh, embrace that hybrid learning and online learning that has been accepted around the world for decades now is something that we should also think very seriously about. And so we have been exploring, and I think we are one of the uh, few universities who are making significant investments in platform learning. Uh, we have teamed up with uh, RBSoft and we are creating something called Lums X, which will go live very soon, where we will have uh, online courses, certificates and other programs. Uh, but then uh, remember the, the motivation here is to, again, speak to access and to diversity so that the online medium can provide. This does not mean that we are going to diminish or not pay attention to residential and in-person learning. There's no substitute for that. But at the same time, there are several benefits for learners when we think about hybrid models and platform learning. Finally, uh, let me talk about uh, learning without borders in terms of our institutional priorities for research and teaching. Now, you know, um, in North America, my experience there, which has been for many decades, I left Pakistan when I was a young man uh, in 1976. Uh, and uh, thank goodness for my sister who stayed in, in Pakistan, in Karachi, actually. And I've had many occasions to come back and forth. I came to Lums once to give a talk, but never imagined that I would be returning back uh, and spending uh, five years, which will end next June, that will be the end of my first term. And while I've been asked to serve another five years, I don't know if that's going to happen uh, because my family is still in Canada. Uh, but nevertheless, <clears throat> what I will say is that, um, you know, the norm for research in research intensive universities in North America, in Europe is so dominant in the way faculty spend their time that it has, practically speaking, uh, made teaching a poor cousin. Uh, sometimes it's considered a load. In fact, my, my uh, uh, colleagues speak of teaching as if they're carrying some burden called teaching rather than embracing it as a privilege for us to be custodians and mentors and, in, and inspire the young people with all the knowledge that we bring to the classroom um, and so on. So one of the things I've tried to do at LUMS is to uh, rebalance the career pathways for faculty to excel in teaching and to be recognized for that, not only just by awards, but also by getting tenure or permanence after a seven year cycle, which includes midterm reviews and so on. So. If there's another occasion and you want to hear about the teaching excellence framework, I'm happy to present that to you, but today I'm going to stick with more broader remarks. Um, what we've done with research though, is we've made choices, simple as that. We've said that um, we notice a lot of faculty doing some excellent work in certain areas that are absolutely aligned with the challenges facing Pakistan. Um, you know, I'd call them grand challenges facing Pakistan. And when I came to LUMS, I saw there were 20 centers scattered and hidden all over the university in the five schools. Sometimes they were born because someone got a grant and they said, let's form a center. Sometimes they were formed because genuinely they felt they could change the world and everything in between. 
we decided we're going to choose seven centers as a focus for the next 15 years. And in fact, uh, we were very lucky to fund the uh, construction of a new building, which you will see coming up in the next two and a half years, uh, right in the middle of the campus. It's called the Central Building Complex, and it will house, instead of a school, it will house centers, these seven centers that I speak of. So we are paying a lot of attention to what these centers are doing. They're multidisciplinary in nature, sometimes transdisciplinary. And the issues we've decided to focus on are energy, water, policy, gender, entrepreneurship, and technology. Now, there are big umbrellas here, but uh, I will give you some specific examples. Pakistan's electric vehicle policy was designed at LUMS by the Energy Institute. Some of you may or may, know, may not know about that. It was adopted by the federal government. We had generous funding from USAID. And as a result, the government has, uh, um, you know, gave us feedback that they are saving $2 billion in the power sector each year for the next 10 years. That's something very tangible. And the power sector, as you know, is one of the big black holes, which a lot of industry and sectors are affected by. Similarly, in the same institute, collaborating with industry partners, specifically in Korea, uh, we developed two and three wheel electric vehicles um, through a system which is quite unique in the world. We're not doing the same thing, going after electric cars. We're looking at the fifth biggest motorcycle market in the world, which is in Pakistan. Uh, I can't tell you how many motorcycles are purchased every day, but you see them everywhere. And they are not only convenient, but they're also a nuisance in terms of uh, climate change and the pollution they cause in, uh, in, our, uh, in and around us. Um, so two spin-off companies have come. Uh, there's an electric rickshaw that is on the road now. It uses something called a swappable battery. And a swappable battery is one where you literally go to a gas station or petrol station, and you take out your battery, which is about this big, hand it over, someone gives you another one, put it in your rickshaw or your motorcycle, and off you go. This probably takes less time than filling up your gas tank. And it is ecologically friendly. The electric vehicle policy has also been accepted. And inshallah, if we can uh, uh, see how we can scale up the pilot project, you will soon be seeing a lot of rickshaws uh, out there uh, that are uh, um, priced at the same range for regular rickshaws uh, with a fairly sophisticated method of financing. There's another pilot project I'm really excited about uh, using regenerative farming techniques. Now you might say, you're not an agricultural university. What are you doing with farming? Why are you interested in that? Well, I'm not uh, a farmer, nor do I know anything about farming. But when I was approached by uh, four professors, one is a, a biologist, another is an electrical engineer, another is an anthropologist and another was an economist. And they said, look, you, you know, the cricket field behind that you have, and then there's a, also a soccer field. You have some three or four canals there that I don't see being used very productively. Can you give it to us? We want to do an experiment. What's the experiment? The experiment was to grow wheat uh, using these regenerative uh, techniques uh, also using a lot of smart agriculture and devices like, uh, uh, of course, solar panels and uh, uh, these uh, drones that monitor and collect data. And what they accomplished in one season was to produce the same yield as a conventional farmer, except no pesticides, zero pesticides, and one third of the water was used. Now, if you just do the math here for a small farmer, when your cost goes dramatically down because you don't use pesticides and your water, which is abundant but so scarce at the same time in Pakistan, then you've got the makings of something that could be scaled that the small farmer would benefit from. So uh, this is the kind of uh, example where we want to champion scalable indigenous solutions that millions can benefit from in emerging markets like Pakistan. 
Now, I will speak a little bit about the uh, teaching excellence framework uh, through an institute we have uh, uh, started called the uh, LUMS Learning Institute. And I'm so glad to see that uh, you have a leader here and your own version of this uh, teaching and learning center. Um, you know, these, at least in Canada, every university has one. And when I discovered here, there are few and far between um, uh, I was at least um, very enthusiastic to learn that so many people are interested in getting these going. And it takes two, three, four people to start a center. Uh, as long as you have a clear vision of what the center will do to support faculty, which is the main mission to improve pedagogy. So there's faculty development as one leg of the center we have. But then we often forget that students are not customers, nor are they recipients who are spectators in the learning process. They must be not only engaged, but they must be regarded as full partners in the academic enterprise. So we have uh, started off a program called Student Partnerships. And in these partnerships, students become co-authors, they become co-designers, they become co-researchers. In fact, uh, many of them who are willing to uh, work on the university campus when they go overseas are being encouraged to do that here in Pakistan. So we've started up a couple of restaurants on campus and we want students to run them. We have a store, they can run that too. If they want to work in the finance department, we have a student partnership program for them. So the idea is for students to earn as they learn, which is common around the world, and it's time our students uh, embrace that model. And we have seen a, a lot of uptake in that. Um, <clears throat> one other thing that's starting this fall I'm really excited about is I notice a lot of our uh, uh, students, they sort of come into this world of academia, they choose a school, and then that's their world. The programs that we have come up with, as rich as they are, to serve a discipline really are not talking to the other disciplines that exist on that same campus. So this is a big challenge for universities around the world. How do we re-engineer our curriculum so at least the student gets a chance to learn how a physicist thinks as opposed to someone who's looking at the same problem through the eyes of a humanist or for that matter, an economist or a business person or an engineer. And we have these experts on campus. So we came up with a solution called LUMS 100. And I'm excited to share that with you because I've insisted every dean teach that course. Uh, uh, I'm teaching that course as well. I'm very excited to go back into the classroom. I sneak whenever I can and give lectures, uh, much to the dismay of my senior administrators. Uh, but nevertheless, <clears throat> I think that's one way to really understand what is going on in the core business of our work, which is to work with our students. So LUMS 100 is 10 lectures <clears throat> for 1,200 people. And each instructor, including myself, will give five lectures. So we will have 1,200 divided by five as an audience. I'll do that within two or three days. And that's how the 10 lectures will be given. Uh, the assessment for this course will be a question. The whole lecture is a 75 minute lecture. <clears throat> so if you have some expertise, you must have a burning question you've been trying to solve for your, uh, uh, you know, your experience. And uh, my, I was a bit confused about the question I would choose because my training has been in finance, but my PhD is in psychology. So I was thinking, okay, um, what do we do here? But we have questions to ask and we uh, don't have necessarily answers, but at least we can present our views and thoughts and thinking about those questions. So the assessment will be one question per lecture that the student can give their own insights and views about. So this is something that has been a challenge to get people to sign up and insert in our curriculum, but it's the way forward in integrating our disciplines. I want to talk a little bit about experiential learning because I know that's important for you as it is for all universities now. A lot of students say the distance between theory and practice is very vast 
and they really want to get their, you know, they want to get some uh, real experience in the real world, which they will walk into after graduation. <clears throat> so of course you have internships, you have, you probably have practicums, you probably have other co-op programs or ways in which you get your students to interface with different sectors. That's good, we do, we do that too. <clears throat> But what we don't do well, I think, is work together as um, offering experiences uh, from across the country. So one day, as I was having lunch, uh, this gentleman knocked on my door. People usually don't. This is the home I live in on campus. And he announced himself. He said, uh, <clears throat> I know you were in Canada. I was in Canada. I'm now the vice chancellor for the University of Baltistan, and I'd like to uh, do an experiential program with you. So he had my attention. He said, I'm just gonna take five minutes to give you my pitch. Of course, he didn't take five minutes. He took about five hours <clears throat> and he loves to speak. This is Dr. Naeem uh, uh, from U of B. Anyway, we had a wonderful conversation. I got super excited. This was about uh, nine months ago. And we said, how do we do this so that it's better than anything done in the rest of the world? And the way we found forward was to identify five topics, five courses. We found five experts from each of our schools. We invited the Balti uh, professors to come to LUMS. They co-designed the courses with us. And the kicker here was that 75% of the course had to be field-based. So the students had to go out to the community, collect data, design interventions, and make a difference. Uh, and that's what they did in Skardu in July. So 150 of our students went up to Skardu, twinned with 150 Balti students. And I don't know if you've been, how many people have been to Skardu? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you don't have a place to accommodate 300 people for a month uh, to live there. And of course, the first week they arrived, there was a slide. The slide went in the Sadpara Dam. The Sadpara Dam blocked all the water that feeds the community. Nobody had water for a week. For the locals, it's all right, we'll make do. For LUM students, oh my God, you know. Vice Chancellor, is this some sort of a Siberian camp that you have sent us to for punishment that we don't deserve? We don't have drinking water. We don't have water to clean ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how it started. A very bumpy ride, but boy, did they learn. Because their, their colleagues, this is how they live. These are the challenges they have. You know, we talk about load shedding in Lahore or in Karachi or elsewhere. Do you know in Skardu, 12 hours of load shedding every day. Now, if you were a patient in an operating theater in the only hospital in Skardu, can you imagine the disaster when the lights go off? You're in the operating theater. There's no power. The backup systems take a long time to kick in. These were the kinds of problems that the students were trying to address. How can we bridge some power management and make this work so we can save lives? How can we go up to the DOSI planes, which they did, and discover that we have an infinite variety of plants, including medicinal plants, uh, that are used for, to explain perhaps why people in the North live 20 years more than people in big cities. So, uh, so many lessons to learn. When I went there on graduation day, uh, <clears throat> at the end of July, there were 50 posters from all these courses. And I invite you to look at them because I think this is the kind of model where we need to do experiential learning programs, even if it means getting our students out of their comfort zone, working with perhaps you guys or other universities in different parts of Pakistan. And this I think is a better model of collaboration than one of competition, which uh, doesn't serve us that well. <clears throat> okay, I don't know if I'm going too long. Uh, I do have another few minutes. 
Should I keep going? Yes. All right, <clears throat> great. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I think uh, one of the other concerns that we both share equally is the question about quality, right? Quality is, of course, what is going to transcend our work and continue the institution and take them to different heights. The measure of quality, uh, I've just tried to highlight two or three parts here in terms of uh, um, our uh, emphasis on access and diversity and inclusion, uh, our emphasis on multidisciplinarity, and then our emphasis on channeling our research efforts to solve Pakistan's problems. Right, And in this process, of course, we always have to put our students first so that students become those uh, ambassadors, those champions who actually go out there and, and change, the, change the face of Pakistan. I'm happy to tell you that a lot of our students have joined the civil service. I know you have a Fulbright program. Uh, I think LUMS has a, a small claim here that we produce more Fulbright Fulbright scholars than any university in the world. And that's not a small uh, um, um, measure because these students are coming from various strata of society. And when they come and have this educational experience, they are going right back to their communities to give what they received as a gift called education. So I want to leave you with a little story there are lots of stories we've written and documented. In fact, 17,000 could be written for all the alumni that have gone through our doors, as I'm sure you can tell your stories. I want to leave you with a story of the son of a tea stall vendor uh, from the NOP program from uh, 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 Basti Dhupsari, which is a, a village in Multan, I think, where this young man grew up um, and uh, joined LUMS and see what he is up to. He was our first valedictorian in our 2019 convocation. So I leave you with this video. Um, and then if we do have time, I'm very happy to answer any questions or any other comments that you would like to make. Thank you very much. Wakas. Heather was born in Basti Dhupsari in Multan and is one of the eight siblings of a son of a tea stall vendor. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you your valedictorian, Mr. Wakas Heather. मेरी जो कहानी शुरू होती है वो बस्ती धूप सड़ी मुल्तान का एक छोटा सा ही गांव है वहां से शुरू होती है मेरे भाई के एक दोस्त हैं वो मेरे भाई के पास आए उन्होंने मुझे कहा कि चलें हम चलते हैं वो खास को एक प्राइवेट स्कूल में दाखिल कराते हैं मैट्रिक करने के बाद वकास इधर आया मुल्तान में माली हालात मुश्किल थे तो उसने बच्चों को ट्यूशन वगैरह पढ़ाना शुरू कर दिया और बाकी लोगों के चलो कुछ आरन यार हो जाएंगे और आसानी हो जाएगी मेरे लिए मैंने उसको रोका यार इधर आप अभी कमाना शुरू कर दें तो आपकी एनर्जी वेस्ट होगी और जिस मकाम पे मैं आपको देखना चाह रहा हूं उस मकाम पे आप पहुंच नहीं पाएंगे मेरे एक सीनियर हैं जो कि लम्स के एनपी स्कॉलर रह चुके हैं इरफान हुसैन ही टोल्ड मी कि लम्स एक ऐसी यूनिवर्सिटी है जो पढ़ने के साथ-साथ आपको 60000 स्टाइपेंड भी देती है and that was a moment when I said that this is the university where I will be. The moment I entered LUMS was, you can say, the culmination of the wait, which I was doing in the past two years or three years. Because the NOP process is based on one or two years. The four or five days initially were a very big cultural shock for me. I saw that you can study from the first time that you can study from the first time that you can study. गेम्स खेलना भी कोई चीज होती है मैं फैसबुक बताता हूँ तो अच्छी इतनी बड़ी यूनिवर्सिटी है कि वो उन्होंने बाहर भी कंप्यूटर लगा के रखे हैं जहाँ पे इतनी डाइवर्सिटी जो है आपके लिए कॉन्फ्लिक्स क्रिएट करती है वहाँ पे इट्स एन अपॉर्चुनिटी फॉर यू एस वेल कि आप सीख क्या सकते हैं शुरू के ही कुछ दिन थे जहाँ पर मेरी जो मीटिंग हुई डॉक्टर जैरा वहीद के साथ एंड शी गेव मी वन थिंग दैट रिमेन पार्ट ऑफ मी फॉर नेक्स्ट फोर ईयर्स 
सर के बेटा पढ़ाई करना लेकिन सिर्फ पढ़ाई ही ना करना मैंने एज अ मेडिकल फर्स्ट रिस्पॉन्डर सर्व किया आई वॉज ऑल्सो पार्ट ऑफ एमनेस्टी इंटरनेशनल जो लम्स का चैप्टर है उसका भी हिस्सा था जब मैं इन सोसाइटीज़ का हिस्सा था तो मुझे लगता था कि चले ठीक है ये तो लम्स का हिस्सा है जब मैं ग्रेजुएट हो जाऊँगा तो क्या होगा सो विद माई ओन रूम मेट जैद मकसूद हमने ये किया कि चराग की फाउंडेशन रखी तो अगर हम आज की बात करें तो ऐसा है कि टू एटी प्लस स्टूडेंट्स ऐसे हैं यूनिवर्सिटी के जिनके सेमेस्टर्स की फ़ी हमने पे की है चालीस बच्चे ऐसे हैं जिन्हें हम प्राइवेट स्कूल में भेजते हैं और हम उनकी जो सारी कॉस्ट ऑफ एजुकेशन है स्टेशनरी कॉपीज पेंसिल बैग्स ट्रैवलिंग हम सारी की सारी जो कॉस्ट है वो हम बेयर कर रहे हैं इल्म के चराग के बाद चराग इतना एक्सपेंड हुआ कि हमने बस्ती धूप सड़ी के अंदर ही अपना एक चराग वोकेशनल ट्रेनिंग स्कूल तमीर किया मैं एक ऐसे एजुकेशन सिस्टम की बुनियाद रखना चाहता हूं, जहां पे हमारे तालीमी निज़ाम के साथ साथ स्किल डेवलपमेंट है ये भी हम इन्हें दे सकें मेरी ज़िंदगी का सबसे चेरिशेबल मोमेंट था दैट वाज माय ओन वैली डिक्टोरियन स्पीच आई सॉ दैट आईज आर एक्चुअली लुकिंग मी और लेकिन मुझसे ज़्यादा जब मैं अपने वालदे को गले मिला हूँ तो उस टाइम पे सारे लोग मेरे वालिद साहब को और वालदा को देख रहे हैं और मेरे भाई मेरी स्पीच सुन नहीं सके वो इतना इमोशनल हो के इन द मिडल ऑफ स्पीच ही लेफ्ट द हॉल और जब वो स्पीच ख़त्म होगी उन्हें पता चल गया कि स्पीच ख़त्म होगी देन ही एंटर्ड बैक वो जैसे मुझे मिला है यकीन जाने की इतनी खुशी हुई बेतहाशा कि बस मुझे यही बात मिल रहा पता चल रहा था कि मेरा बस बेटा है और मेरे जिसम का एक हिस्सा है ये असी उत्ते पहुँच गए यदि वालदा भी आई मैं भी आमी ये आग के जैसी दुआ की थी अल्लाह पा का इनू जरी अच्छी तरक्की देवें साढ़ा इलाका जोड़ा है गरीब आदमी है तो सारे मेहनत मजदूरी वाले जिमें मैं अपने बच्चे पढ़ाया है साड़ी बस्ती दो सड़ी दे जिमें डीवा बल है तुसा भी अपने बच्चे भेजो ताकि डीवे चू डीवा बल Vakas Heder was born in Basti Dhupsari in Multan and is one of the Thank you Dr Arshid for giving us a lot to think about um there's a lot of uh, ways that I see some similarities in things that we are doing there's a lot of ways that I think that we can grow from uh from the things you've shared today so thank you very much I would invite Dr Adelton at this point to give some comments Uh, thank you all. I think another great day for the faculty retreat. I uh, very much appreciate uh, Dr. Roxana what she's done to make this happen, and of course, I uh, very much appreciate Dr. Arshad. I think that uh, perhaps Dr. Trumbull and I had some of the same thoughts going through here, which was a combination of certainly ad admiration and inspiration, uh, combined with a sense. And for me, this is actually kind of a reassurance that uh, what you're doing, what you're aspiring to, what you're trying to do. is very similar in a number of respects to what we have going on here so i think perhaps more than most uh talks that i've been part of this one really resonated um some of these things are challenges some of them obviously you made great progress some of them i think we have a good story to tell as well a good narrative um but i think what i came up with and this was one thing that got applause for is of course the room for cooperation is the fact in a in a higher education this is a country like you said of 220 million people uh and i've said this to people as well in a higher education um system in pakistan where only a small percentage of people have the opportunity to go to university and learn uh definitely our fellow institutions our peer institutions even the entire higher education sector in pakistan is not a competitor we're all, we're all in this together and we're working very hard to improve it uh, for pakistan uh and again that's why in so many ways i was heartened by your speech uh, by, by your remarks i mean there it was a more informal quality to them which i also appreciate um but i just feel like wow we're we're definitely swimming in the same direction or or jogging in the same or maybe running sometimes in the same direction um but again it was very heartening to get your perspective um to and 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 to realize that um uh, we are in this together uh and our 
aspiration to make Pakistan a better place. Um, appreciate the acknowledgement of our uh, motto, by the way. Uh, when we had our earlier brief, and I should have said it, I often say it to my love serve one another, but I think this combination of love and service is also one of the features that we would bring to the table and say, this is something that we really want to bring to Pakistan. Uh, and this is also one of our foundational thoughts when we reflect on what we can do. But again, thank you for an absolutely terrific uh, uh, set of remarks uh, and for the inspiration and for the challenge that they brought with them. We always do have a small gift. Um, I'll, I'll pass this on to you as well. It's a small memento of, of branded items, uh, but it does have our motto on it as well. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, here we go. This is the uh, your collection. Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, one from the medicine. Uh, well, the uh, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. So I think that there you go from here to the T, I think. And uh, I, again, this is uh, one of the great things about this building. As you see the pattern on the side, it's great for conversation with the T. And so uh, this concludes, I guess, day three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.